Dear beloved, when, uh, when Princess Diana and Mother Teresa died at right about the same time, there's quite a bit more of a public outcry of or out, out, outpouring of grief over Princess Di than there was for Mother Teresa. Uh, I remember, remember my mom cried about, about Princess Diana, but she didn't cry about Mother Teresa. Uh, it, why? It was, uh, it was something that the people asked at the time. Uh, sociologists wondering, why do people seem to care more about this one than they do with this one? Both were worldwide known figures I and mean, celebrities, uh, known for good things. Uh, both did some good things, but Mother Teresa did more. Uh, so if we're going to cry over them because of what they do, this isn't making sense. So, um, and it's been almost 10 years, so I'm not the first one to, to ask this or, or to suggest this, but uh, sociologists kind of kind of talked about Mother Teresa as a hero figure, uh, which we'll kind of see some people you might view Samson as a hero figure, but really, um, Samson's not. Uh, but whether or not you view Mother Teresa as a hero figure or not, everyone agreed. Uh, ultimately, the reason it seems that, that the world gave more of an outpouring of grief over Princess Diana than they did for Mother Teresa was because Mother Teresa did not seem to care a bit about how she looked, obviously. Yeah. But Princess Diana did, and she was very good at it. And that's something that most people can relate with. Right? Uh, Mother Teresa didn't seem to care at all about her own comfort or personal gain or her reputation, what people thought about her, based on how she looked, at all. And most people just can't relate with that. So they don't connect. So when she dies, I don't relate with her. I don't feel as connected. Princess Diana, she embodies everything that seems most important to me. People are related with that. And so if that's the case, then we should all be able to relate really well with Samson. Because he's, he's strong in the flesh, but he's weak in the spirit. All he cares about, all he wants, is the flesh. All about that flesh. Uh, Samson was an Israelite during the, the period of the judges. He was, he was one of Israel's leaders. He was a, one of the judges. Uh, it's just during that time, after they left Egypt, after the 40 years of wandering, but before Israel became its own kingdom. And, and God had made Israel a promise. Right? He made it to Adam and Eve and Abraham and Jacob, and he told them, I'm going to watch over your family. I'm going to bless your descendants. I'm going to make them into a great nation, and I will protect and I will maintain that nation until from that nation comes the promised savior of the world. And at this time, at the time of Samson, that promise is kind of in jeopardy. And the Israelites don't care. They've got this enemy, the Philistines. Uh, and they, they're they intermingling, intermarrying, and inter economying with the, the Philistines. And there were some battles, and, 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 and the Philistines would win most of them. And then they would capture some Israelites. But once they did, they really weren't cruel to them. They were just kind of absorbing the Israelites. And the Israelites were kind of like, they found some appeal in that. Uh, because at this time, they're just not a kingdom. They're just a nationality, a group of thousands and thousands of people who are just supposed to live according to how God wants them to live. Uh, and and they, they found some appeal in this established nation. Uh, and God says, that's not good. You can't do that. You can't join them. For you to join them, it means for you to follow them. And if you follow them, then you're not following me. And that is not okay. They can join you. That's fine. And so to address this, to save these people who didn't even want to be saved, God raises up for them a strong man. Samson. To be their leader. To, to lead the Israelites in this effort of saying, I will not be one of you. I will not join you. Israelites, remember who you are. Now, Samson is such a spiritually immature person. And he doesn't go about this effort for spiritual reasons. He, he's so spiritually immature, he doesn't really, really see. He's not aware of the spiritual issues. He doesn't recognize what any of this has to do with God or what God's promises. He gets caught up in this and, and takes on a leading role because he himself married a Philistine woman against his parents' wishes and advice. 
He saw one that he wanted to be with, and he had to have her. He married her. And then at the wedding, Samson presents this riddle. Uh, he, he liked to do that kind of thing. He liked to try to trick people. We see that in his discourse with Delilah. Why can't you just tell me? Tell me straight up. Why can't I tell me the fourth time? Why can't you just tell me the first time? And that was Samson. He was always tricking, um, trying to avoid the truth. And, and he, at, the, at his wedding, he does so with this riddle. Uh, it was an effort to trick the Philistine guests at his wedding, you know, his, 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 his bride's family and friends. Uh, this all just comes from his arrogance. I mean, he's arrogant, primarily his arrogance is, is based on his, his body. He's big, strong, beautiful, talented, capable, and he's arrogant. Uh, in his arrogance, he, he just presents this riddle in, in an effort to trick uh, the guests at his wedding, and, and then he turns it into a bet. If you can figure it out, I'll give you all, this, all these things. If you can't figure it out, then, then, then you have to give me all these things. Uh, but they end up cheating, and then, so they beat him at the riddle, and then he's angry, so in retaliation, he kills some of them. In retaliation, the father does not let him see his, his new Philistine bride. In retaliation, he burns their fields. In retaliation, they kill his Philistine wife. In retaliation, he kills hundreds of them. The kind of thing he would do, the job would have done. Uh, that's, that's the man that God raised up to be the leader of Israel. The time where they needed to be saved and they didn't even want to be. Samson. He's really strong, right? Absolutely. He's, he's very strong and he has long hair. I mean, God had told him, as long as you have long hair, you'll, you'll be strong. So Samson's like a Superman with sort of hair for kryptonite. Really strong. Absolutely. He, he beat up a lion. He could take on thousands of men single-handedly. But he's not a hero. Great physical prowess. But what you need to know about Samson, to understand the story, Samson was deeply weak, morally, spiritually, deeply flawed. Not a hero, not virtuous. He's more the anti-hero. He's kind of the Israelite James Bond. If you read the whole story of Samson from Judges 13 through 16, you see that he, he's having sex with a bunch of different women, and he's cracking jokes whenever he's killing people. Uh, this is a man who is following his own voice, following the desires of himself, doing his own duty, not following God's voice, not doing God's duty. He does not love God most. What about the hair? Right? God told Samson's mother, even before he was born, to make sure that he, his head was never shaved. And so Samson's never had his hair cut. And then he gets into this relationship with Delilah. You see in his arrogance, he's kind of given up on marriage now. Uh, he gets into this relationship with Delilah. Samson, for all his physical strength, he was not strong enough to control his physical lusts. And then the Philistines made up a deal. They, they bought out Delilah. They said, if you can figure it out, if you can find out the source of his strength, if you can figure out how he's so strong, then we'll give you a whole lot of money. And so eventually, Samson tells her, we're told, he tells her everything. You might think, well, that was stupid. Why would you do that? Well, do you really think it's the hair? I mean, is he really strong because he has long hair? Does God love him because he has good hair? Is there any part of Samson's body that enables him to be so blessed? Absolutely not. The hair is not the source of the strength. That's ridiculous. Samson knows that. God is the source of the strength. The hair was Samson's end of the deal, was Samson's outward sign of commitment, trust, and faith in God. And you take, you take that hair away, he has no more faith. There's no more evidence of faith in Samson. You take that hair away. Without faith, he's nothing. Without faith, he has no strength. Samson doesn't get it. Obviously, I'm not strong because of my hair, he's thinking. 
I know what God said, but it doesn't make any sense, and I don't care about what God said. Look, you look at the progression here. Does Samson tell Delilah the truth? No. Does he want her to be able to subdue him? No. Does he expect her to have subdued him? I mean, he has every reason to know what's going to happen next, right? I told her to tie me with bowstrings. I told her to tie me with fresh ropes. I told her to put my hair in the fabric mill. She did it all. If I tell her to cut my hair, she's going to. He knows that. And yet he wakes up and he's surprised. He told he did not know that the Lord had left him. Samson's at this point, I don't care what God said. That doesn't make any sense to me. I just know what I want. He doesn't care about salvation. At that moment with Delilah, all he cares about is having and touching and feeling and using that body. And Samson tells Delilah everything and lets her cut his hair. It's an act of rejection, rebellion, and a complete lack of trust in God. So God takes his strength away. The only reason he still had that strength was because God had made him a promise. It wasn't because Samson was so good or so faithful. The opposite was true in Samson's life. But he, God made a promise. And when that hair was gone, God took the strength away too. So then Samson is, is captured. He's imprisoned. He has his eyes gouged out. And it's then, in humility, for the first time in his life, Samson recognizes his greatest needs and what a fool he is. And somewhere in prison, as he's grinding grain, God's strong man repents. Finally turns to the Lord, who had blessed him his entire life. Now that the things Samson had always loved the most were gone, now that the stumbling blocks are out of the way, now he can love the Lord. His body had never been so weak, but his faith had never been so strong. For when we are weak, then we are strong. And the Philistines had a party. They were celebrating. They had Samson. They had God's strong men in jail. And so then they bring Samson in to entertain them, uh, to mock him at this party. And God gave Samson back his strength and humility. In reliance on something other than himself, he once again became strong. Through God's blessing. And Samson knocks down pillars, toppling a building down upon himself and thousands of Philistines, sacrificing himself to save God's people, people who didn't even want to be saved. Just like Samson. And what it took for Samson to get there, what it took for him to rely on, on God and not on himself, what it took for Samson was for him to have his eyes gouged out. For when, when you're blind, the idol of the body is gone. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. That's the kind of cosmetic surgery that Jesus recommended. Because it would be far better for you to be blind now than for you to ever live with the idol of the body. So let's talk about the idol of the body. Perhaps some things we can do to recognize it, some things we can do about it, to address it, without needing to be plucking out our eyes. Um, when you find yourself wishing that you were more like somebody else, is it because you wish you looked more like them or that you wish you um, had some physical capabilities that they have that you don't? Or is it because you wish that you could behave like them? Is it about visible things or invisible things? Uh, the world is shallow and superficial and, and we experience that every day. Um, do you find yourself more interested <clears throat> in losing weight or avoiding sin? I'm not asking which one you think is more important. It's which one do you find yourself giving more attention and effort to every day? Losing weight or avoiding sin? Uh, do you ever think something like, I wish I was better at sports, or again, just kind of fill in the blank with any physical activity. I wish I was better at that physical activity, or something like, I wish I was better at sharing the gospel. Which one do you think more of? 
Do you find yourself more concerned with what it takes to make yourself look good or what it takes to make people love Jesus? And which one of those, whatever it takes, do you pursue? Do you find yourself getting more excited when your children look cute or pretty or handsome? Or when your children show the love of Christ and forgiveness? Which one do you post on Facebook more often? How your children look? Or how your children love you? Let's go! If I eat a piece of chocolate cake, it's going to have an adverse effect on my body. If I view pornography, it's going to have an adverse effect on my soul and my life. It's only going to damage my relationship with Jesus and the relationship with the real people in my life. But I can work off the adverse effects of the chocolate cake. I can go for a run. The adverse effects of the sins of my past go far beyond shame. It's guilt. Just suffering and hell. Every one. And one of those endless effects can and have been worked off only by Jesus. Yet there are some more. More adverse effects of the, the sins of my past. And it's kind of different than shame. It's adverse effects like being comfortable doing it again. Being more likely to take the next step and do something else. Being comfortable with the sins of the people around me, even the, the people I love. These adverse effects also need to stop. Uh, and these are adverse effects that I am in a position to be able to address and begin to work off. And in order for me to do that, the first thing is you need to stop it. Don't do it anymore. The sins of your past need to be the sins of your past. And then I need to surround myself with good influences. Right, sanctified Christians, not hypocritical, ignorant ones who are going to pretend like sin's okay and want you to give them a pat on the back about theirs. But sanctified Christians who care more about Jesus than anything else. And I need to put myself in contact with Christ. In word and sacrament. You think of all the things that you do every day to take good care of your body. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. What do you do for your soul? You think of all you do to take care of your body, and how long will that investment last? Think of what you can do to take care of your soul and realize how long that investment will last. What do you do to take care of your soul, feeding it and nourishing it with God's Word? God's Word alone that gives you the strength to avoid the danger and poison of temptation. When did, when did Jesus ever say anything about how important it is for you to take good care of your body? I can think of one thing Jesus said about taking care of your body. Give us this day our daily bread. Even that is one seventh of a prayer that makes it very clear the care of your soul, the concern you have for your soul is far more important than what you think about your flesh. Jesus said, don't worry about food or clothing. Your heavenly father will take care of that. It's the pagans who worry about such meaningless things. When the Bible says that your body is a temple, that doesn't mean you need to sculpt it and keep it beautiful. That doesn't mean, so eat well and exercise. Not that that's a bad thing, right? Again, idols, what are they? They're good things in our lives that we love too much. When we love, we love them too much, when we love them more than our God. I'm not telling you don't take care of your body, I'm just saying let's take care of our souls. Recognize that it's far more important. So uh, when the Bible says your body is a temple, that means you represent Christ in this world. You are the temple of Christ, the Holy Spirit. And Christ has nothing to do with vanity. 
Samson defeated his enemies in spite of their effort to destroy him, actually through their efforts to destroy him, and so did Jesus. Destroyed his enemies in spite of their effort to destroy him, through their effort to destroy him, and he needed to. He had to save them. They were in need of salvation because of their effort to destroy him. And yet, as he was on the cross, he was the strongest man in the world. It didn't look like it at all. But on that cross was the strongest man in the world. Because as they were piercing him, he did the strongest thing anyone could have done. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. They don't even want to be saved. It would have been easier. And the weak person would have. He said, Father, curse them as, as they are cursing me. But that's not what he said. And as a result, 50 days later, those who killed him, those who not only called him ugly, but made him ugly, 50 days later, they were being baptized in the Spirit by the thousands. What? The story of Samson shows us that God only needs one. In order for him to save his people, he can save a whole nation through one man. Even a foolish nation, an idolatrous nation, a rebellious nation, a nation of people who are in denial, a nation of people who like sin, he can save through one man. And when Jesus Christ came, he fought. He fought the battle of living the life we should have lived. He never found any appeal in a pornographic image. He never made anyone feel as if they were just an object or a prize. And he never treated anyone as if they were in any way less because of how they looked. He lived caring always far more for his soul than he ever did for his body. And for Jesus, the soul is what he knew. The soul is what he had had always, all along. Yet the flesh is what was new because the flesh he had taken on only for you, to give it up for you. Because the flesh does not matter. He lived every day caring far more for his soul than he did for his body and far more about his father than he ever did for himself. And when he died, he died the death that we should have died. And he wasn't bound just with cords of rope. He was bound with the bands of death. He did it as our leader and as our substitute. And when he rose, he didn't just break the bands. He broke death. God treated him as if he had done everything we have done. So now, God can look at us and see us as, as if we have lived the life that he lived. When God looks at you, get this. When God looks at you, he does not look at your body. He looks at your soul, which is covered in Christ. God looks at you and sees your soul and he sees Christ. Because of your faith, God sees you without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. Perfect and holy in his sight. So what's the point? What do we do? What, what can we learn from Samson? Well, did God use Samson because he was so good? So strong, so beautiful, so faithful. No. God uses flawed people, weak people, because that's all there is. So we say, God, use me. Work through me, because I am a messed up and flawed person. I can't do it on my own. You admit your weaknesses and your flaws, and you cling to the one who is perfect and beautiful and strong. And God works in you. God strengthens you in spite of your flaws. And he loves you. As if you had won the battles of Jesus Christ, as if you were the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And 
that makes you humble. If someone comes to you and says something like, thank you, your example helped me through my time of crisis. But no one's ever going to say your abs helped me. Your words. Your words helped me. Your words brought me to, pointed me to, shared Christ with me. Your words changed my life. In my eternity. And when someone says something like that to you, that humbles you because you know it's not you. God does that. Through you. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Jesus' words of warning there have a pretty good picture of Samson. He was losing his soul. He had strength, fame, power, leadership, love. But he didn't have the only thing that mattered. He was so close to just losing it all. Just before it's too late. Just before Samson, Samson gets all wrapped up in Delilah. He cannot return. Right before it's too late, God humbles him. By taking away all of the things that mattered most to him. So that it could be clear, the only thing that matters is his God. By the grace of God, he took away the only things that Samson ever wanted. Samson repented. He lost his life, but he finally had his God. And his words there at the end gave us really the greatest plea that any, any person can make at the end of their life. We saw it from the, the thief on the cross, and we see it here from Samson, too. And he says, Lord, remember me. God, I rely on you. There is nothing in myself, who I am or what I am done, that I can rely on. So, God, I need you to remember me. God gave Samson amazing abilities. God gives each of us strengths and amazing abilities too. And we can use them to serve Him. You can't be too weak to serve God. We all are. You can't be too weak to serve God. You can only be too proud. God used Samson to save His people from the Philistines and God sent Jesus to save us all from much greater enemies. Sin, death, and Satan's power. The people who care more about their bodies than they do their souls are idiots and cowards. Don't be that. Get rid of your idols, get rid of your stumbling blocks, and find the strength of God and your Savior's love. Whether you feel ugly or you feel weak, look to Jesus Christ and let him slay your pride. Because without pride, you don't care how you look and you don't care what anybody else thinks about you. Look to Jesus. Care what people think about Jesus. Care what you can do to make Jesus look good. And let him slay any sense of being unworthy within you because you know that he loves you and it has nothing to do with how you look. Jesus already won the battle, but we continue to fight. Fight against sin and, and fight to live like we know it. To live like we know Jesus loves us, regardless of how we look. And fight to tell others about it too. You are beloved. You are eternal. You are saved. And it has nothing to do with your mind. Trust in the love of Christ. Always. God grant you. Amen. And may the love of God which surpasses our understanding guard and keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus until life everlasting.